Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Karn Academy. My name is Karn, and today we're going to be talking about restrictive lung diseases. Now, this isn't a very high yield concept and is an R2 or R3 on your matrix. However, when we keep talking about restrictive lung diseases, we contrast them with our obstructive lung diseases. And that's very commonly an exam question, um, being able to differentiate between the two on pulmonary function testing. So having a good understanding of how they present and what the prominent causes are, I think is really important. So interstitial lung diseases, which are the restrictive lung diseases, refer to the ones where we have inflammation and damage and fibrosis at the alveolar level. Remember, this is at the alveoli, not up in the bronchi, in the alveoli. This may be either due to exposures, um, occupational drugs, or um, it may be due to secondary underlying diseases, or it may be idiopathic. So the few main ones you need to know, asbestosis and silicosis, or of, often minors occupational hazard, with drugs amiodarone, a common antiarrhythmic, bleomycin, uh, a chemotherapy drug typically used for Hodgkin's lymphoma and methotrexate, all can lead to interstitial lung disease. Important underlying diseases that you need to know that can cause um, interstitial fibrosis include sarcoidosis, SLE, um, and other connective tissue diseases, as well as TB and Legionella. Now, the question is to why this happens. So with, obviously, sarcoidosis has a tendency to affect the lungs. It typically affects young African-American women. With SLE, because it is a connective tissue disease, it affects connective tissue diseases, connective tissues um, throughout the body. These include the, the nephrons, uh, the joints, which is why you have your arthropathies that present with SLE, um, as well as the alveolar type 2 hyaline membranes. And it does affect the alveolar um, basement membranes as well, which is why once you have inflammation there, you end up fibrosing that, and that obviously leads to reduced diffusion capacity and restrictive lung diseases because you lose that nice elasticity of the alveoli. So risk factors for those are going to be relatively straightforward. So exposure to any of them. Smoking, as you can imagine, affects, oops, affects every lung condition on the planet. And surprisingly, having a genetic predisposition to interstitial lung diseases is another big one, especially for the idiopathic group. Some common associations, important ones to know include pleural plaques, um, if seen on chest x-rays, typical of asbestosis. And with that, you need to worry about the development of mesotheliomas that can often be obviously a complication of that, but it takes roughly 10 years for mesotheliomas to develop and they are quite deadly and have a really bad prognosis. Iron, well, iron work is, um, you need to think of sidrosis, which is Basically, uh, an interstitial lung disease because of the deposition of, uh, of iron in the alveoli. And similarly, if the same thing is happening with silica uh, or anything that involves sand, that's going to lead to silicosis. And that typically presents with actual calcifications on chest x-rays. Now, when we take our history, how is this going to present? As you can imagine, it's going to present with some shortness of breath, a cough, fatigue, but at this point, you may be asking yourself, Karen, this sounds like, firstly, every other lung condition. What is specific about interstitial lung disease that sets it apart? Well, the answer, honestly, is that there's very little based on the signs and symptoms that is going to get, get you to a diagnosis alone. You need to ask a good um, corroborative, corroborative history with their occupational history. And that's often going to lead to some evidence. You also need to ask about any systemic illnesses that they may have, because based on even adding weight loss, fever, night sweats, you may, it, it may sound like cancer, right? So just based on this cancer. So you need to always in, in this particular demographic, ask questions that you, to, to rule out cancer effectively. And which is why we also like to investigate them quite aggressively. So some red flags for cancer might include weight loss, fever, night sweats, and as you know, you may have Horner's symptoms with apical tumor compression, and that's going to present with um, facial involvement. And you'll have to ask about 
upper limb neural changes with brachial plexus, brachial plexus compression. On examination, some certain things that are specific to interstitial lung diseases include fine inspiratory crackles and digital clubbing um, or clubbing in the digits. And it's often quite a late sign. Over time, you can develop something called core pulmonale, which is right heart failure in isolation. So what's happening here is because you effectively have fibrosed much of the lung's architecture, you can't effectively pump a lot of blood to it. If you can't pump blood to it, it's going to backflow. And where is it going to backflow into? It's going to backflow into the right-sided heart. The left-sided heart and the output of that still remains relatively unaffected, but you end up with symptoms of right heart failure in isolation. So that includes your pitting edema, your hepatosplenomegaly, your ascites, elevated JVP, all those without anything else should all, 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 almost always raise a red flag in your mind as to could this be a lung pathology that's causing this. Investigations, um, obviously we're going to start off with some pulmonary function testing, which would tell us that this is a restrictive lung picture. You can also do a DLCO, which would tell you that you have a low diffusion capacity. Why does that happen? Again, once we fibrose the alveolar membrane, that's going to lead to deposition of fibrin and other cartilage that's not necessarily good at diffusion. And that's going to lead to a bulk of your symptom with exertional dyspnea and the fatigue. It's also good to do a chest x-ray because you do see reticular opacities with interstitial lung disease, and also you can see ground glass appearance. However, CTs or high contrast CTs in particular are considered the gold standard for, them, for this. And the three main signs or changes that would be seen that I think you should know include the presence of variable cystic lesions or honeycombing, bronchiectasis, which is thickening of the bronchi um, bronchioles, and you notice increased thickness of the septum. This is, again, because you have the deposition of fibrous material, which increases the septal thickness. This would also obviously lead to poor diffusion capacity. If nothing else gives, you can also do a biopsy or a bronchoalveolar lavage. What is a bronchoalveolar lavage? Basically, when we put a scope down, we pump some fluid and collect that same fluid and observe that fluid under a microscope to identify anything that might be picked up in that. And that's often used for occupational-based um, exposures if you suspect things like asbestos, silicosis, which may be picked up on that. So let's look at some x-rays. Looking at this in particular, I would hopefully like you to still adopt a systematic approach, but in the interest of time, looking at what's, in, what's really relevant here, we can notice some Changes in the mid middle zones here bilaterally, you can see some increased reticular opacities present bilaterally. You can also see what appears to be these increased opacities or these wire-like markings across the chest, across the middle. Um, any takers as to what that might be? Um, pause. So that is basically um, metallic wires that are used to close up the sternum back after open, open chest surgery. So this person has had um, surgery which involved opening up the sternum. And that's just marked in green here. Looking at some CTs now. So CTs are going to be a bit harder to interpret at a third year level. But I think what we can look for in particular, firstly, here you can notice how you have some nice large cystic spaces, or this would also be called honeycombing, you can see that the septum or this gap here, which is ideally meant to be nice and thin like this, is thickened here. So you have increased septal thickness. And you can also see how some of the bronchioles are thickened or the walls of the bronchioles are thickened. And that's bronchiectasis, right? You can see some here. You can see some here. You can see some here. Um, you can't really see much on the right side, but uh, yep, so that's bronchiectasis. And that's just locked here. So we have bronchiectasis, increased septal thickness, and the cystic lesions. This is also idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. 
Now the question is to which part of the lung is affected. So if we go back to this picture, oops, you can see that the part of the lung affected is primarily the middle lobes, right? Um, it's also important to know that different kinds of idio uh, different kinds of interstitial lung diseases affect different parts of the lung. So we have causes of fibrosis that affect predominantly the upper zones. The main ones you need to know include silicosis, sarcoidosis, and TB, along with ankylosing spondylitis. But then you also have fibrosis that predominantly affect the lower zones. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the, which is the most commonly seen one, affects the lower zones. Most connective tissue disorders affect the lower zones. Drug-induced affect lower zones and asbestosis. So the way I like to think about this is if you had no idea and you could not be bothered learning this list, just ask yourself, is this occupational? If it is, if it seems occupational, everything including hypersensitivity pneumonitis, coal workers, pneumonocosis, silicosis, um, all of these are gonna be upper zones versus the only occupational one that affects the lower zones is asbestosis. Um, yep. Also, we have an acronym. So we have an acronym for the cause that affect the upper zones. So CHARGE, C for coal, work, coal workers, pneumoniosis, H for hypersensitive pneumonitis, A for angst bond, R for radiation for radiation pneumonitis, T for TB, S for silicosis and sarcoidosis. Oops. Um, yep. So how do we manage interstitial lung diseases. Um, so this is actually a really interesting front for research and new development because at, the, at this point in time, there, there really isn't much we can do to reverse interstitial lung diseases once they've kicked in. The goal is to eliminate the cause and prevent further damage and slow down the progression if we can identify a trigger. So if this is an environmental trigger, obviously getting them off the job, finding replacements, fairly straightforward. If this is kind of a secondary cause, we want to treat that. And because most of these are immune mediated, whether it be sarcoid, angst bond, SLE, um, un undifferentiated or mixed connective tissue disease, most of them are going to be immune related, which would be managed with corticosteroids or immunomodulators. If nothing else gives the actual um, target or the actual tissue damage, um, we only have either oxygen therapy to m m help with their symptoms or in later stages, consider a lung transplant. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, only 30% of patients actually do respond and uh, most of them tend to progress to end-stage respiratory failure. That's all the information I had for restrictive lung diseases. Thank you guys for coming. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch on my email through facebook i'm always happy to answer questions and as always please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones